Hi, welcome to Doomer Optimism. I'm your host this week, Stephen, known as Life Smith on Twitter. And I have Ben and KMO as our guest and as our co-host. Um, ben, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hello, everyone. Um, I am from the Finger Lakes region in Auburn, New York. And I um, kind of got this plugged in where I, I wanted KMO, our guest, to join into the Doomer Optimist conversation sphere. Um, I initially found him when he was just getting out of his doomery mindset and um, kind of fit the mold of, you know, not really being pleased with the way the world was and being uh, easily latched on to, you know, if we didn't have uh, resources so readily at our fingertips, we would be a little bit more um, kind of sane and wouldn't be able to have so much power to corrupt ourselves with. And then, you know, sort of kept listening to his podcasts and quickly got back to where I was basically um, so that I don't ramble too much. I'll just push it on to KMO or- Well, how about LifeSmith? Sure. So uh, um, I'll just say for the record, LifeSmith and I spent over an hour talking earlier today for my uh, paywalled podcast, The Sea Realm Vault. Yeah, it's kind of kind of funny the way this fell together. Um, so I, for myself, I got in, involved with the, the whole ethos of what is now being coined Doomer Optimism about... 11 years ago when I divorced and as my personal life started to fall apart, um, somehow I started to notice various conversations about the world falling apart. And KMO was one of those people with his Sea Realm podcast that caught my attention. And I don't remember because I wasn't on Twitter back then. I don't know, even in 2012, you know, it was probably was something with Twitter, but not the way it is all social media is now. And uh, so I enjoyed listening to the conversations about peak oil, and I don't even remember all the other conversations you had. I know I've heard you recite, KMO, various aspects of the arc of your, your podcast. And I myself also um, started to think, hey, we sh I don't know exactly what you're up to and where your head is at with that, all that stuff. Um, I know you do the Sea Realm less now, and you've got your Podverb podcast that you work with. But for me, I'm joining the Doomer Optimism podcast as one of the producers in the background. It just kind of fit where I see things now with the world. The idea behind Doomer Optimism is the doom part is kind of recognizing um, that the world is changing and changing in ways that we really can't predict and that a lot of the techno utopian stories about going to Mars and green energy and things like that probably aren't going to come true there's a really high probability that they won't. Uh, and when I get in touch and tell myself the truth about that, or at least the way I see that and, and the consensus that I participate in, that then there's a real possibility for optimism because there's like, well, what is it that I have to work with rather than working with a fantasy? So the optimism isn't like we're screwed. It's just like, it's not gonna go the way that I was told as a kid no flying cars likely or not fl mass flying cars, things like that. So that's my take on the Doomer Optimism conversation. And so I'm just kind of wondering, you wanna kind of touch on your journey and uh, given that we both found you <laughs> earlier in the path and it seems like your arc has shifted significantly. Yeah, well, I was a uh, techno utopian in the nineties and uh, a singularitarian before, you know, that, that phrase was widely known. Uh, and then I swung hard to the far extreme, you know, in a time when my life was not going well. And I didn't realize it at the time, but there's always an audience that is hungry for tales of impending doom and societal collapse. And typically the people who are hungry for those tales are ones who seriously disapprove of some aspect of society. They don't just kind of disapprove. The thought of willingly participating in it is offensive to them, and they just want to see it die. And 
I was kind of in that place for a time. And that's when I was really susceptible to, you know, tales of doom. But the calendar was really against me because I really got into the peak oil narrative in 2007. And I was steeped in it and had been talking to people about it and was pretty good at, you know, conveying it myself in 2008, when it really looked like everything was going to fall apart. I mean, I, I think maybe a lot of younger people, if there are younger people listening to this, my audiences have tended to be older, even older than me, and I'm 54. Uh, but, you know, people who were just kids at the time probably don't remember what a fragile, you know, dicey time 2008 was. It really seemed like society could fall apart in short order, but it didn't. And, you know, in tech, there's a saying, too early is wrong. And, you know, if you bet, if you structure your life as if collapse is coming two, three, five years from now, and it comes 70 years from now, you were just straight up wrong about collapse. You just got it wrong. And you messed up. <laughs> you could have had a much better life if you had just lived your life, you know, as, as your society you know, encouraged you to. And I know that that whole notion of just, you know, being a sheeple, being a good little obedient robot uh, is offensive to a lot of people who are really into doom. But, you know, like the term normie, the term normie is, a, is an insult. You don't want to be a normie. You know, the normies are the people who don't think. They're the people who just accept opinions. But eventually, you know, the contrarian opinion, like a lot of people will hold a contrarian opinion because it marks their intelligence. I've noticed a lot of people, uh, like if, if you're college educated and you're even remotely liberal, you're supposed to hate the United States. You know, you're supposed to think of the United States as this evil empire because that's the sophisticated position. But really that's social signaling. That's just you signaling to other people, look, I'm not one of those redneck guys with the American flag bumper sticker on his truck you know, saying my country wrong or right. I'm not in that tribe. Those people are stupid. Those people are primitive. I'm smart. I'm educated. I'm sophisticated. I recognize that the United States is evil. But then, you know, you can progress past this contrarian position to a meta contrarian position where you really look at the history of how empires have behaved. And then you compare that to the behavior of the United States and the Bretton Woods Agreement and the post-war period. And you think, eh, the U.S., as empires go, pretty beneficent, pretty benevolent. Yeah, yeah, you can point to a lot of bad behavior, but not like the Mongols, <laughs> you know, not like okay. the Romans. Yeah, let me, let me stop you there and ask sure. a, a interesting question I have, though, because I've been curious in the bit that I have seen your your attitude change. Um, well, two, two things come to me. One is, is I would dis disagree or see your point of, I get the idea of being um, too early could be a problem, but for this, for the most of our listeners in the Doomer Optimism community, it's not like reducing one's life and suffering. I mean, there's, you know, John Michael Greer has been saying for a long time, and maybe it was also Kunstler, but collapse now and avoid the rush, right? That you may remember, remember that phrase. Mm -hmm. um, but you'll find that most of our audience is not, what they're doing, they're finding is improving the quality of their life, no matter what happens, whether there's collapse or not. It's like that cartoon that, that's out there where there's some scientist on a stage pointing at charts and someone in the audience up, gets up and says, well, what if we do all these things to make life better and there, it isn't peak oil or it isn't, things don't collapse. You know, it's the the idea that the changes that a lot of people want to make are real changes in improving the quality of their life that are independent of of the doom or the collapse. Um, I think if you do bunker down and hunker down prematurely and suffer in the process, yeah, what you're what you're saying is makes sense. It's like, well, I could have enjoyed my life, and I'm gonna. There's no point in suffering because I'm expecting five years from now that things are gonna collapse. So I think there's a I have a little different take on that, obviously. Than, than I feel I similar think. there, where I straddled both. Um, you know, I didn't quit my full time job and say, "All right, we're going to get some sheep and we're going to do an, an management intensive grazing," which I really wanted to. I was really excited about that. Um, I just did as much gardening and 
hobby sort of a, a scythe, you know, a way to mow without fossil fuels as much as I, as I could, along with the playing the the, the game typically as I could. Um, and I also wondered that too about you know KMO here and how much like you went into it. I'm not sure like how much did you um did you make any rash decisions where you quit a job or you dedicated like like all your time to to going for it. I know you had said you you lived uh, you were invited by um, so I forget his name now to a a, a living communal area. And, and you also tried farming, like, wow, it's, that'll kick your A. <laughs> well, I, I tried farming. Um, I apprenticed under a market gardener, uh, a French guy who is raising vegetables on like three quarters of an acre around his house and supporting his family with it. And I apprenticed under him. Uh, and that was before I was at all interested in the peak oil story. Oh. And um it was really the Michael Michael Pollan's books, uh, Second Nature, A Gardener's Education, and A Place of My Own that really got me wanting to build a house out in the country. And I, I bought some rural land and I started building um, basically a papercrete earthship, but I ran out of money and had to move someplace, you know, where I could, where there was a population and an economy where I could plug into and actually make some money. And then I got into insurance which is just horrible, <laughs> a horrible thing to do. And you know, apologies to any insurance agents who might be listening, but that was just not for me. And um, that was when like, I was out of money, doing this work that I hated and floundering. And that's when podcasting came along. And I started listening to podcasts that were really appealing to me, you know, very professionally, professional sounding podcasts about things that I was really interested in. And, you know, I was really into Terrence McKenna. I was listening to the... Um, uh, psychedelic salon podcast and uh, the dope cast and the Viking youth power hour. And that was all very exciting to me. So I wanted to get into podcasting and I got into podcasting out of excitement for the medium and I was into it and I was still, you know, in my techno utopian mindset, but that's when I encountered uh, Dmitry Orloff was really my entry into the, the peak oil sphere. And I interviewed him and then I interviewed Jim Kunstler and I interviewed Albert Bates. And once you interview a handful of, you know, the big names in any subculture, Alexa, stop. As soon as you interview a few people, you know, in any given area, others just beat a path to your door. You don't even really have to look for them. And I just, you know, got into that, that, that rut. And I don't want to say rut. I got into that groove uh, in terms of the people that I was interviewing, but at the same time, you know, my life in other areas was bad. My marriage was bad. And, you know, I was really angry at society. And I was in a position where I was open to this idea that, yeah, it could fall apart and good riddance, you know? Um, yeah, I, I but, know that feeling because I was kind of in that same place at that same time when you were pointing that out. I, I would agree that I from myself and I see with other people the same thing as like my life sucks let's just burn the whole thing down but as I said before when I reached that point personally that was 2008 <laughs> you know that's when it really did look like everything was going to come down yeah. so uh, that was just a really uh, you know I look back on it now as a bad confluence of events but I don't really I mean I regret that I did get divorced and that my kids grew up under some other guy's roof and I didn't really get to spend as much time with my kids as I would have. And, you know, they're grown now. So that's, that ship has sailed. There's no fixing that. Um, but, you know, I met a lot of great people. As uh, Benjamin said, I, I spent two years at the Eco Village Training Center. Albert Bates invited that, me to come stay there. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I, you know, I went to the last big peak oil conference in Washington, DC in 2011, uh, you know, and, Lots of Kunstler wasn't there, but everybody else you could name in this whole, you know, ecosystem was there. It was quite the gathering. And I can't regret that, you know, so it's, it's been an interesting journey, but the longer I stayed in that community and the more people that I met who were interested in it, the more I started to see the commonality of dissatisfaction, disapproval, and a sort of wishful thinking that I, I, this life and this you know, hyper capitalist, industrial, high tech mediated life is not agreeing with me personally. It does not satisfy my social needs, my emotional needs, my physical needs are satisfied to the point where I'm, you know, I'm fat. God damn it. <laughs> 
You know, I, if there's too much, too, too many calories. Uh, and I would, I would prefer to live in a situation where, you know, I, I have occasional brushes with physical danger and adrenaline pumps through my system. I get into this fight or flight mode and I either fight or I, you know, run away or whatever, and then it's over and the stress is gone. We're evolved for that. We are evolved to do that. We are not evolved to sit in an office and experience constant low level stress that never goes away. It's miserable. So the more I was you know, inter or interacting with people in these interconnected communities, because it's not just peak oil, you know, peak oil overlaps with environmental communities. And then they, they all kind of overlap with the antinatalist communities, which is really this like misanthropic nexus of people who just hate humanity. They think that consciousness, that just sub subjectivity, having an experience of life is the worst possible thing. And you know, that's the thing that's wrong with the universe. And that's what needs to be fixed. We need to stop having babies and not have any more conscious entities come into the world. When you encounter that that point of view, and I did encounter it, and I actually lived in it for a little while, considered it, um, you know, presented it on the podcast, not with any intent of refuting it, just to say, hey, here, here's this point of view. Let me describe it to you. Um, those people are so toxic they are so unpleasant and abrasive. I think to some degree it was interacting with the antinatalists online, which really made me see, oh, these are the real hardcore malcontents and they just hate everything that is good, really, you know, and um, was, looking back on it, I, I did a video, I, I made a YouTube video that was, it was high production value. You know, I had a green screen behind me with images put up behind me and I was reading off a teleprompter, you know, I made it at a TV station. And unfortunately, that is my highest viewed video on YouTube. And I don't take it down because, you know, I, I do get AdSense revenue from it. But I did years ago, turn off the comments, because the comments are just so unrelentingly pessimistic, negative, angry, petty, petulant. And I just wanted to I mean, rejecting that, I think it didn't really have anything logically to do with rejecting doomerism across the board, but that was like, that was so distasteful that in pushing that away, I think I pushed away a lot else to the point where maybe I've overcorrected and maybe I'm, I'm deliberately tuning out things like uh, there was a question in the prepared list of, you know, is there anything I'm doomerish about now? Well, the thing that I think is a real danger of, you know, ruining everybody's life forever irreversibly is nuclear war. And that is a real possibility, but there's nothing I can do about it. There's no lifestyle change I can make to, you know, reduce the risk of nuclear war. So I, I I'm of the opinion that fear makes us stupid. And if you voluntarily wallow in fear because you get some sort of validation out of it, that's harmful. I mean, that's, that is blameworthy. That is, that is to be condemned, you know, deliberately knowingly wallowing in fear. Um, and I think the same is true of negativity. So with Doomer optimism, I'm so on board with the optimism part. I mean, there's just, you know, medical research demonstrates optimistic people have better life outcomes. It is just better to be optimistic. Uh, the Doomer part, I disagree with just because of epistemological humility. It's just, there's so much data to take in and we tend to take it in in the context of a narrative. So if you're into the collapse narrative and you go out into the World Wide Web and you try to make a rational, objective assessment, you're not going to. You're going to fill in the gaps. You're going to pick the data that reinforces the narrative that you're attracted to for emotional reasons. So the doomer part, I absolutely reject. But optimism, absolutely yes. And our society, our consumer-centric capitalist society is dependent on most people never being satisfied. And it doesn't take a lot of resources to provide a good life. What you need is to feel useful in a community. You need to have, you know, satisfying interactions with other human beings. You need to think that they regard you well. You need to have a skill or some capacity that makes you feel like you matter. These things are not hard to come by. They're not expensive. But if you don't ever realize that that's what you're after, then you will continuously buy, you know, be working to buy the next thing, that thing that might make you happy, the car, the clothes, the plastic surgery, the gender affirming surgery. I mean, we should probably avoid that topic entirely, but 
I think that's madness. And, you know, this is all set up to keep you on the hamster wheel. But if you realize there's what I actually want to satisfy myself as a biological social entity is not that expensive and it's not that hard to come by, that realization will take you far just in terms of quality of life and, you know, living a satisfying existence. And I, I know I'm, I'm ranting, so I'll stop. <laughs> it was a fantastic rant. <laughs> I'm curious about, so you pointed to your shift. Um, it sounds like the antinatalists were the ones who kind of pushed you over the edge. Looking um, back on it, those are the people that I found most distasteful. Just their whole approach to interacting with other human beings, I yeah. find utterly distasteful. Well, I don't think any of those folks are, are part of our audience. There's quite an, an anti-antinatalist thread yeah. in, the, <laughs> in the Twitter DO community. In fact, there's a whole bunch of, you know, back to, to uh, what do they call it? trad traditional family stuff so um you know this this community is more aligned with you in, in many ways than it might first seem to you i think it sounds like there's some disagreements on the, still the take it's not so much the the take on the doom or, or as how would i say it the there's a recognition for a lot of people that things can't continue like i said um, but the, the dealing with it is the optimist side. So it's like the optimism is having a family, you know, raising your kids, doing meaningful work, all the things you just, you just spouted in your rant is the optimism side of, of the Doomer um, piece. And what, and then we like to say it's a big tent that a lot of people can, can wear the Doomer Optimism t-shirt if we ever have one or hold up the mug. Um, because there's a lot of disagreement about the the issues or the way to deal with them, but the rec just kind of the recognition of getting back to community and the the values that that some people could say were traditional values. So I'm I the part that I'm curious about, since it doesn't sound like you're not quite on the techno utopian path, but there's something you don't see it going, you don't see near-term human extinction or societal empire collapse as concerns for the near future, from what I can gather in what you've said. Is that true? And then say a little bit uh, more about that. You know, I've, I've read four books by a guy named Peter Zion, whose major thesis is that the United States is not collapsing. The United States has such enormous advantages going for it in terms of natural resources <laughs> and geography that it's, it's gonna be fine. But the U.S. is definitely withdrawing from its global commitments that it made after World War II, you know, to fight communism. It basically rallied most of the world in opposition to the Soviet Union. Well, the Soviet Union has been gone for 30 years, and the U.S. has been withdrawing its commitments. You know, if you are insist, if you want to condemn the United States and empires are bad because George Lucas, then, you know, you want to call the U.S. an empire. And if it leaves its imperial phase, then you want to describe it as the empire collapsed. But, you know, empires are expensive. And if if you, over time, gradually withdraw your foreign troops, you know, and you, uh, you reorient in a non-catastrophic way, to me, describing that as the collapse of an empire is just needlessly, not, not just needlessly pessimistic and, and negative, but just inaccurate. You know, the U.S., yes, is is withdrawing from its strongly militarist internationalist phase because the stimulus that caused that is gone. You know, Russia is not the Soviet Union. It's not really an ideological state. It's not trying to export Russianism to the rest of the world. You know, uh, the U.S. has no, it, it's, it's so expensive too. It costs so much to do that. And we, we've got much better uses for those resources. So, to me, the idea that the empire is collapsing is just a, a needlessly provocative and condemnatory way of saying the United States is no longer committed to this imperial project and we are going to reorient and do things differently, which I think is a good thing. Great. Ben, you have any questions? I'm going to look at our notes here and see what... Uh... Well, I can think back on the rants and there was a couple of things that popped up in my head, but um 
I'd have to be lucky to remember them now. <laughs> um, go back, go back a little bit, rewind. Maybe that'd spark my memory, but that's why I'm not a podcast host, I guess. <laughs> There you go. Well, pen and um, paper, buddy. That's that's my. Oh yeah, I mean, oh yeah, I got it right here. <laughs> so, what are you optimistic about for the future? How are you? How are you orient orienting towards your life towards the future that you you see coming towards us, or that you're creating? There are different ways to take on how the future shows up in our lives. Ah, you know, I'm not really structuring my life around any grand narrative about the future. Uh, I have, I, I am 54. My youngest son turned 18. Uh, my child support obligations are winding down. And I have been like, I, I've been a, a world traveler since my 20s. And for the past 13 years, I have not been eligible for a passport uh, because of child support obligations. And I'm looking to get back out into the world and you know, I'd like to get back to Southeast Asia for a while. Uh, South America's calling to me. I, I want to go someplace cheap. This winter, I'm going to go to uh, Nevada, California. I'm going to work at a ski resort making snow, <laughs> you know, uh, and save up some money and and just, you know, get out there and enjoy life and not worry too much about some grand narrative that is bigger than my human life. Yeah, I think... Um, I'm generally agnostic with regard to like, is it going to collapse or, or how quick? Um, so that's, I don't know, to say something. And it sounds like that's similar to KMO and kind of where I settled in the past. It was about like 2020 where I peaked in my doomerism and then, um, which had started in 2015, I felt like we should cut off fossil fuels and damn the consequences. And then like, to think back on that perspective now is like wow and and um and I had a my wife and I had a daughter and it's pretty much you know that's that describes mine too I don't I don't structure my life around a grand narrative because when it comes to um you know if if making the world a better place depends on everyone else's behavior it's a really toxic kind of way to live and I, I experienced that a little bit with um, getting involved with uh, little committees around here and such. And, you know, they're, they're doing good things, but when it's centered on, you know, we need to stop these other people from living their normie lives. That just doesn't feel right. But I interrupted something there. Go ahead. Well, I was listening. I took a walk earlier and I started listening to, I, I think it's your most recent episode with um, David Holmgren. And uh, I interviewed David Holmgren, I don't know, like 2015, 14, somewhere in there. You know, when I was in the in the height of my, maybe it was 2013. That, that sounds about right. Uh, when I was really hardcore Doomery. And I, I don't know um, the name of the host. It was a, a woman host of the show who was interviewing David probably Holmgren. Ash probably Ashley. Okay. Uh, I think Ashley was saying that she knows people who are like small scale homesteaders uh, who hunt and who have lots of, you know, very practical handcraft sort of skills. And they're doing all the things, you know, that uh, a permaculture inspired homesteader would suggest. And yet they're socially conservative. And part of that is they don't believe in climate change. Yeah. I wanted to bring that um, up too. I thought that was amazing. Yeah. And you know, she made the point, look, they're living the way I would want them to live. Who cares what they believe? But I think most of the people who are really indignant about the fact that red tribers don't believe in climate change, they're not really indignant about how those people are living because how they're living isn't that much different from how the blue tribe is living. You know, they're driving, they're flying, they've got electricity, right. they're using communities. What they're angry about is the difference in belief. Mm hmm. So that says to me that, you know, this, this whole obsession with climate change for most people who are talking about it is not grounded in any sort of reality that is not a social reality. You know, people are signaling their tribal allegiances by condemning other people who have different beliefs. 300, 400 years ago, those would have been beliefs about God. You know, 
thousand years ago, they would have been beliefs about a different set of gods, you know, a different pantheon. Uh, now it's climate change. But it's just identifying group affiliation through blah, blah, mouth noises for most people. That's that's climate change, I think, for most people. And um, I'm just, I'm so not interested in that. I'm so not interested in that. So there are things that, you know, when people talk to me, I'm college educated. I, I talk into a microphone for a living, so I'm fairly articulate. And when they spot those surface details about me, they make assumptions about my political orientation or beliefs that I'm going to hold, which I just don't. And I'm, I'm always in those situations presented with a choice. I can just be noncommittal and make vague statements and not really trip their ideological wires, or I can surprise them. And I can give them well thought out arguments, you know, for something that they will find abhorrent. And it just really depends on if I'm feeling mischievous, you know, sometimes I'll go along to get along in, in any crowd and I can do it in most crowds. Uh, and sometimes, you know, if, if there's alcohol involved, I'm likely to do the mischievous thing. <laughs> how, how does that go? When you give a well thought out argument, is it even received? Sometimes it depends. Um, a lot of times it depends on if there are other blue tribers around that somebody needs to signal to if it's one-on-one -on -one, you know th they might listen uh, makes sense you know? so that's why uh twitter is useless you know for converting anybody because you're not there to actually compare belief systems and try to find the truth you're there to signal to you know the other people in your tribe that you hold the correct beliefs and that you condemn the people who hold the wrong beliefs yeah, and you're I, you know, and you're you're clever enough to, uh, you know, execute a sick burn on them in 240 characters or whatever it is. Yeah, okay, Mo, I would encourage you to find a way to do man on the mic, man with the microphone on the street style content. <laughs> not sure not how here. you would surprise. Not not just... here in Berryville, Arkansas. One, there's nobody on the street. Everybody drives to Walmart, but you know we have this beautiful historic downtown square, and there's nobody on foot there. It's sad. Yeah, it's unique. But I go to Walmart almost every day. <laughs> it's one of the few choices. I have other choices. It's just, I'm sitting here alone, talking into a microphone, interacting with people. I mean, this is the nice part where I'm actually seeing faces and hearing voices. Usually it's just text on a screen or I'm doing audio editing or whatever, just boring stuff in front of a computer. And the only times when I'm around people really is when I go to the gym or when I go to Walmart and that's where all the people are. So, you know, even though I don't really interact with them, I'm among them. There's, there's a part of my monkey brain that needs that. It's uh, it's scary. I can get a little doomery how much convenience over generations will change the culture to where you're less independent. Like for example, Walmart, you go there and it has, everything you need on your outing rather than a downtown place where there's smaller businesses they support uh, their own families they probably pay a lot more taxes in proportion to you know these like walmart and and all that and that's something i you know if i could do something the hard way it'd be great but um i don't I don't know how to, uh, you know, get, you can't just get everyone to do that. To, you know, we gotta, we gotta vote with our dollars and suffocate out, you know, the next level, you know, nineties was Walmart was Amazon. It's just, things are cheaper there. Sometimes you can only get it on Amazon and, um, you know, maybe that's not all bad. We have these conveniences like that, but you know, there's more and more we're, um, cutting off our food supply, so to speak. But I, I know I just kind of stopped worrying about that in the past year or two because I'm one human on the stardust pile. You know, when the need for the human organization, you know, our civilization to change really presses us, we will change. And it will be an emergent change of behavior 
and it's not going to be according to the plans or you know the blueprints of any forward thinking person who saw the collapse coming you know and had their plans in place and proselytized to all the right people you know and got everybody to prepare in just the right way that's not how it's going to play out right you know it's it's going to play out very organically very emergently and you don't really need to worry about what you're going to what part you're going to play in it because it really won't even be up to you the circumstances will dictate you know what you have to deal with and when and you will do your best you know so in the present if you get a lot of satisfaction out of taking a scythe and going out and cutting grass sounds like great abdominal work you know um if it feels good, great, do it. Gardening, I love gardening. I didn't, I didn't have a garden this year. You know, I used to garden a lot when it was procrastination from something I didn't want to do, which was go oh. and sell insurance. That's when I was really into gardening. <laughs> um, that's that's big. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's it's ridiculous in a way that you know I'm still a podcaster and I make money at it, so I kind of have to keep doing it. But you know, and my thing is looking at the big picture, taking in lots of details from different places and speculating about what's happening, you know, and what's going to happen. And at the same time, I think that's ridiculous. You know? <laughs> so it's just an absurdity. Good times. So speaking as a, as a podcaster, we mentioned the, the C realm. We talked a little bit about your journey with that, but you're working on this new um, project, the uh, pad verb. And uh, how did you come across that? And does, how does that kind of fit in with the, the arc of your life and what you just described as far as gathering information and kind of feeding a narrative such that you do? Well, pad verb is a, it's a website that's a resource for podcasters. It's also a, a resource for people who want to appear on podcasts or just podcast listeners. Um, it, it, is a big social graph that maps, you know, who has interviewed who. And like, you can go on there if you're a podcaster and you can enter in, say, you want to know how, how many degrees of separation are there between you and Barack Obama? Say you could go and, and do that. And it'll create this nice little uh, image for you saying, well, you were on a show with this person and they interviewed this other person and that person interviewed Barack Obama. You know, it's like six degrees of Kevin Bacon. But uh, so the guy who is the co-founder of that is just a longtime Sea Realm listener. And when it came time to create a podcast for that site, he just approached me. He said, you want to do it? So it's a paid gig for me. It's not, um, I don't want to say I'm not invested in it because I do have some say in who gets invited and I have veto power over guests, but I'm not the producer. You know, I'm not the one inviting people. Um and there, there is also, you know, in addition to the person I'm talking about, there's another person who's like the CEO of the company who's not into podcasts, really. So it's, um, it's, it's a weird sort of situation, but it's also very satisfying because I am on a team. You know, there's a team of producers. I don't have to do the hard parts, really. I am starting to do some of the editing now, um, which when it first started, I didn't even do any editing, which was very nice. But really, the, the part of podcasting that was really getting tiresome for me was the producer's role, was always sending out the emails, trying to keep the pipeline full, trying to, you know, book dates and arrange times. And that I, that is actually, you know, I started podcasting in 2006. And in 2006, there, were no, there was no competition for guests. You know, like most times when I would invite people onto the show, I would also have to explain to them what a podcast was. It's been a very long time since I've had to explain to anybody what a podcast is. Now everybody's got a podcast and anybody who's doing anything that's remotely interesting is inundated with podcast interview requests. So it was actually way easier to get kind of high profile guests back in 2007, 2008 than it is now. So I'm, I'm really glad to have somebody else doing that work. But the Pad Verb podcast, at first we were kind of heavy on uh, crypto topics and I'm happy to talk about crypto, but at the same time, I didn't want to be totally associated with that. So we've definitely pushed out into other areas and kind of stopped talking about crypto. So if you look at like the last six or eight episodes, it seems to be a show about cognitive science. And, you know, my, my background's in philosophy of mind. And so I'm happy to talk about, you know, and C stands for consciousness. I mean, this has been my thing for a long time. So I'm very happy to be in that space, but it's really, um, there's no talk of collapse and it's it's a very non-political show, like really deliberately non-political, non-partisan on person, 
purpose, focusing very intently on making sense of the world and making sense of our experience of the world. Uh, talking a lot about AI as well. Like the most recent episode was about robotics. I, you know, sent you the link to that. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, it's there's continuity between the Sea Realm podcast and the Padverb podcast, but also there is a definite departure from anything doomy, anything partisan, um, really anything negative. I just don't want to be negative, <laughs> you know? So one, one way to not be negative is just stay, steer very clear of all of those uh, socially divisive issues, you know, focus on science. Culture war pacifist. <laughs> like culture war opt out, you know? Like a, a pacifist has a point of view. It's like they're against the war. They, they think it's bad. I'm like, I'm just not part of that discussion. Y'all go and do your thing. And if you get interested in cognitive science, hey, come listen to this podcast. All right. Well, I uh, feel like we've pretty much summed up like the things that I thought were interesting to, you know, the, the Doomer Optimist side. Um, but like talking on um, cognitive science, something I'm interested in is like I've heard on um, a few different in the, the Doomer Optimist, not their podcast specifically, but um, Peak Oil or any other sort of Doomer area is like getting in like 15 minutes and then someone says, you know, it's hard for people to acknowledge this. They don't want to acknowledge this. But and you know, and you've said you there's an audience for that. People are appealed to it. So those, you know, those those two things are in contradiction there. And um Do you remember the movie, uh, the Netflix original movie with Leonardo DiCaprio and Jennifer Lawrence, Don't Look Up? I still need to see it. <laughs> yeah, I haven't well, seen it, but yeah, that the, was a big deal recently. It's it's a the film is a metaphor for climate change. There's an right. asteroid coming toward the earth. And the, you know, the people in power, and it's, it's actually a Democratic president in power, I think, um, you know, wants to deny that it's a problem. And eventually they come up with the slogan, don't look up. But the whole conceit of the film is that nobody is willing to confront the reality of climate change. Only a brave few are willing to, you know, confront right. the reality of climate change, which is absurd. The mainstream media is obsessed with climate change. You know, political discussions are revolve around climate change. There's there is nobody who is refusing to acknowledge the topic. There are people who are saying, I think you're wrong. <laughs> and there are people who are saying, uh, you know, whatever truth there is to it, I think you're exploiting it for partisan purposes, but there's nobody who is refusing to acknowledge yeah. you know, the topic. You'll hear a lot like or you're, you'll feel or get the sense that it's noble to say what everyone else is saying in this area. And I, I've been bouncing around different areas of the, um, the internet and I've, I don't know why I've been into more talking on um, politics and such. And as soon as 2020 happened, my, my interest went toward like, how are these cities functioning with, you know, these riots? And you have the two perception on, you know, these riots or what they're for and, and the consequences here and there. And, and that's, just basically been, I've been interested in that and listening to only a couple shows, I need to kind of branch out on, on that topic. So I don't know what I'll be interested in next. Next. <laughs> well, Life Smith, you've been very quiet for a long time. Well, yeah, letting, letting Ben get some questions in there. I'm, I'm wondering about, the, again, sort of what you see about the future in terms of like you were involved with the peak oil conversation and your take on things like green energy or a even your your current take on the peak oil conversation well the peak oil conversation seems to be stuck in 2008 like there's there's a well rehearsed uh refutation of fracking you know in the peak oil community they'll tell you it it doesn't scale the wells deplete quickly uh, it requires way too much infrastructure and upfront investment for what you get out of it. And it's like, yeah, that was all true back in 2006, but the technology and the methodology has continued to advance since then. And it's now quite sophisticated. And, you know, wells that were thought to have been exhausted 
are, you know, they're going back with, you know, micro seismic uh, surveying and finding new pockets of hydrocarbons down there in the shale. They're the long laterals, you know, the horizontal drilling goes out much, much further than it used to. So you can go back to an old well and, and get a lot more hydrocarbons out of the ground. And, you know, the, the peak oil folks who are committed to the idea that fracking doesn't work, they just haven't kept track of the advances in the industry and in the technology and the methodology. They're just not interested in that. And if you're not interested in it, and if you're very committed to the, you know, the story that it doesn't work and you have a well-rehearsed explanation for why it's not going to work, you know, for you, that well-rehearsed explanation for why fracking doesn't work, it works for you. The fact that it is completely factually incorrect is of no consequence. Your audience doesn't want to hear about the actual state of fracking technology. They just want to hear you say that it's never going to work, even though the story about why it's never going to work is what, 12 years old, 14 years old? Somehow, you know, we, we still have lots of oil and natural gas coming out of the ground. Yeah, what, okay, so now I asked you about the energy returned on energy invested, often called EROI. And the things that I see say that uh, basically in, in JMG just in this week's uh, publication, his blog post this week points this out again. It's like the EROEI, I'll get it, <laughs> won't even bother trying to say that again, that both for for um, the cost of, for instance, fission, nuclear fission, the only reason it exists is because the government subsidizes it. If it was had to stand commercially viable on its own, it, it wouldn't. And the same thing with, with green energy for, for the reasons of ER. OI and oil is reaching that same thing where it's if it weren't for the false propping up of the economy that that they couldn't afford to pull the oil out of the ground and and that's what I hear um, you know I haven't heard an argument counter to that I mean yes yeah, maybe the fracking technology has improved but the actual financial ability the economic ability to pull that out of the ground is is being depleted more than the oil perhaps. Well, John Michael Greer has also made the argument that for collapse to happen in the way that the peak oil fast collapse people say it's going to, that the people in power have to do nothing to stop it. But if they do nothing to stop it and civilization collapses, then they lose their privileged position of power right. in a high-tech society. And they don't want to do that. So there is a lot of things that the U.S. government does that don't make money. The U.S. military doesn't make money. It is a, an enormous expense. But you know, the government and society in general thinks it is a worthwhile expense. And keeping the lights on is a worthwhile thing to do. If the government has to, you know, feed some money uh, to the right financial or, um, you know, the right institutions in order to keep that money flowing, they're going to do that because what's the alternative? The lights go off. We want the lights to be on. So not everything has to make money. But even that, I mean, and that, that's an argument that John Michael Greer made over a decade ago, and it's as true today as it was then. But my response to the whole energy returned on energy invested argument is I was hearing that argument in 2007. It's now 2022. The predictions that people made based on that argument have not come to pass. And in all likelihood, from my perspective, they're not going to come to pass anytime soon enough for it to be interesting to me. You know, for, for me to make life choices based on those predictions, I think at this point would be utterly foolish. Because as I say, there is a perpetual hunger for tales of doom. There's a guy named Paul Ehrlich, who in 1967 predicted that there would be, you know, widespread famine across the world. People would be starving to death in the United States by 1975 because the population was going to outgrow the food supply. He wrote a very famous book that made a bunch of money called The Population Bomb. Right. Wealthy, comfortable people get thrilled. It's like a horror movie to them. The, the idea that the poor people are multiplying too quickly and they're going to eat all the food and everything's going to be ruined because there's too many poor people. That is a perpetually thrilling horror story that people love to hear. Well, you know, 1975 came and went. Famines did not materialize. But Paul Ehrlich was such a celebrity that, you know, you can go and find uh, clips of him on the Johnny Carson show in 1980. And he's welcomed back five years after the catastrophic failure of his predictions 
as a celebrity, because that's what he is. He's a celebrity storyteller who tells an exciting tale about impending collapse because there's too many people, too many mouths to feed. We can't, it's unsustainable. The idea that we're going to continue to sustain all of these people on the earth and keep everybody fed through the year 2000, that's hopium. That's crazy, unrealistic, irrational exuberance writ large, you know? But here we are, 2022, and we're still more worried about getting fat than we are about starving to death, you know? So if you base your life's decisions on those predictions and, you know, if you do it for a little while, it's understandable. But then if you realize, wait, there's always somebody preaching doom and there's always lots of people who are eager to hear it. Why, why are the predictions of doom this year when I happen to get into it? Why are they suddenly legit? I mean, if you're, if you're familiar with the history of doomsaying, if you're familiar with the history of collapse mongering, and you know, then you ask yourself, well, if those arguments that JMG were making back in 2007 haven't materialized in any sort of you know, oil scarcity collapse, if they haven't materialized by now, what makes those arguments compelling now? Yeah, there's smart people everywhere, and I can't, I can't say yay or nay either way. I'm agnostic, and smart yeah, people have a really ways. excellent ability to right. tune out facts and to grab to reinforce their preferred belief system with very sophisticated argumentation. That's that's a talent that smart people have. You know, much much intelligence is invested in maintaining comforting illusions that people have gravitated to for very emotional reasons. I'm remembering when you talked about that, um, I got interested in money. Um, Chris Smaji, Smage, I'm not sure. He cited a book, uh, Fictitious Capital. Uh, read that. That was kind of financial gobbledygook, hard to absorb. But, you know, the money and where it goes is a form of energy socially. And, um, you know, the that's that's an interesting thing to pay attention to um and even listening to zion's latest book talking about how we floated off the dollar in the 70s and you know all this is going to get weird and then um we've printed a crazy amount of money in the past couple of years and we can just kind of like make it and it's not based on anything in physical reality and it seems like that's going to be a problem at some point but the it just keeps going and and i don't know what the hell's going on but the the power that the the federal reserve has to in a weird way like choose where the money goes and all this stuff is it's pretty interesting and i don't know the, the federal reserve just has one button you know they have one lever they can raise or lower interest rates that's, that's infinite, all they can do oh it's gonna say infinite utter <laughs> well yeah there is one thing i want to say this is a perpetual um, irritant for me. Doom saying, you know, there's always an audience for it. If there's an audience for it, you can't really blame somebody for providing the product, which is clearly in demand. That's fine. But there's a particular variety of doom saying that really gets under my skin. And that is when old men who worked in the system and accumulated capital in the system their whole lives, get the doomer bug at the end of their life, go and buy a big lavish doomstead and start doing things that they think are, you know, praiseworthy in, in a, you know, collapsed environment or in preparation for a collapse. They then proselytize to young people to say, you know, the system is collapsing. The machine is dying. Don't, don't be dependent on it. Come out here to the country but without all the capital that I spent a lifetime acquiring in the system, come out here without that and get ready for collapse. And young people do that every single year. You know, when I was at the Eco Village Training Center, there was a constant stream of idealistic young people looking for a more authentic existence. They wanted to live out in the country and grow their own food and build their own buildings and, you know, have their animals. And the old hippies at the farm didn't really want them there because they did that 30 years ago. It was hard work. They don't want to go back to it. You know, they want their comfortable retirement existence. And it was just Albert Bates and the Eco Village Training Center that was sort of this back door into the farm. So young people could come in and, and do that. But when you're in your 20s, 
this is the time to get some education that's going to allow you to get into a high paying position somewhere and make some money. And if you don't do that, then you get to be like me at age 54 with no money, no capital, no choices. I mean, you know, I'm kind of a vagabond. I go and do stuff anyway, even without uh, proper financing. But, you know, for the person who participated in the system is not necessarily wealthy, but they're certainly comfortable to get the doom bug in late life and then proselytize to young people and say, come out here to the country. Young people, if you go out there to the country, you will be slave labor. You will be paid very, very little. You will, you know, like the, uh, the World Economic Forum says, you will own nothing and be happy. Well, you will own nothing but you won't really be happy. You'll be tired, you'll be frustrated, you'll be angry, and then you'll get into middle age. And yeah, you'll have some neat experiences and you'll know some people. I mean, there will be rewards to that life, but it will be very hard. And you'll likely get to middle age and discover that society didn't collapse, the industrial system didn't collapse, and it has expectations of you that involve you having taken advantage of the opportunities that presented to you, that it presented to you, and that you you passed on those opportunities because some old guy out in the boonies was saying, it's all going to collapse. Come out here with me, you know, come join my commune, come join my doomstead. And invariably in these communities, the person who's got the money is the boss. They call the shots. If you came out there and all you bring is youthful exuberance and your ability to labor, well, that labor will be extracted from you. And the guy with the money is going to tell you what's what. And that's how it is. I mean, that's how it is out in the idyllic, you know, idealistic or er, er, rural communities, you know, these, these earth-centric, uh, very idealistic sort of vision-oriented communities. It still comes down to who's got the money. And you don't want to be the person who doesn't have it. Yeah, I thought being a plumber would have been good when I was still in my doomer mindset, you know, like things are collapsing, that seems pretty essential, water. Um, but I stayed, I work with the developmentally disabled and um, I've just stayed with that and I'm very patient, so I'll stick with that. You know, it's, and I've, and I had wondered in that doomer mindset, what would this profession be like in a collapsy sort of world? And I don't know, it'd be, an interesting question to explore. You, you can't anticipate that. You just can't. <laughs> well, I, I think, Kimo, what, what, what I hear in the, the thread that you're saying, or, or the thread I hear in what you're saying around, particularly the, the criticism of the, the doomer mindset, as, as you've experienced it, is very important. Like, I've, I've had to reflect myself on, I, I do see the likelihood of some sort of collapse. And I can't argue with your point of view, your, you know, what you've noticed, the, the predictions that don't come true and things like that. And and I do question, like back when I referred to that that cartoon about, well, what if what if we do all these things to make the planet healthier and things don't collapse? And I've been in the system myself and and like homesteading is not something like it's it's I'm clear it's a romantic idea. Right, especially um, for me as a single single guy of my age, it's like I'm just not up for starting a homestead by myself, um, unless I married some into some family with money and, and all of that. I I can't afford to buy it, all that. But what I keep coming back to for myself is some version of, like I said, following what feels true for me, not completely or watching where I'm buying into somebody else's story. Like I hear, like I'm, I'm not going to sacrifice my life and my happiness to avoid the doom or to prepare for the doom. And it, it's, I've now find myself shifting careers, as it were, from working in hotels doing corporate events to going to to work on the land in Colombia. But that, when I strip all that story and my own thirst for doom that gets triggered, it's just what I want to do. And, and I, when I was interviewed and when I was a guest on the podcast here, that's what I pointed to people was like, kind of what you're saying. It's like, just follow the thing that's next and then trust. But I, 
I would say like for me, it's being collapse aware, like there's a possibility, but nobody really does know the future. There's some things that seem to be the direction of it. So I, I can definitely align and, and say that, yeah, you make a really good point to, to shut oneself out of opportunities simply because there's a narrative to buy into, especially, but it requires a certain amount of self-awareness for sure. And I did spend plenty of time doing my own personal growth stuff, but I'm actually now done, pretty much done with that. Like all the, all the people doing these retreats and things that they're, they're not of in, any interest to me anymore. In terms of simple advice for a better life, for me, the low hanging fruit is physical fitness and a very, very moderate meditation practice. For me, it's 10 minutes in the morning with an app. You know, it's just part of my daily routine and the benefits are so, they so outweigh the very minimal uh, effort that is required. You know, it's, it's, it's such a simple habit to uh, to instill, particularly, I mean, if you use the, the hated technology, you know, that that hated evil smartphone, it can do some good stuff for you. I mean, get a meditation app on that smartphone and do it for 10 minutes. I mean, you'll easily spend 10 minutes of your day just scrolling through the phone anyway, just, you know, right. do a little, uh, this much mindfulness meditation every day has enormous benefits. So would you call yourself a techno realist these days i but not even i don't feel any great need to assign a label to myself in terms of my beliefs good um, for you yeah i mean it just about everything i'm agnostic <laughs> you know it's like i don't know uh, what i know is that mindfulness meditation pays off with very little effort put in and um like for me physical exercise is mostly just lifting weights because that has the best energy return or, you know, the best return on the energy invested. Uh, I find that, you know, I like, I like to walk. I, you would have to get a bull whip and whip me with it to get me to jog, but you know, walking is good. Lifting weights is good. Um, but you know, whatever, I mean, I'm, I'm going to go and do fairly hard physical labor on the mountain this winter, you know, so rich people can have lots of snow to glide down. Uh, but I'm really looking forward to that. I know that, you know, physical activity feels good. We are, we are built to move and sitting in front of computers all day is not what we are adapted for. So you're not a fan of the metaverse? I have zero interest in virtual reality. I, you know, when I was in the 90s, I was reading books by Jaron Lanier and uh, Howard Rheingold about artificial intelligence or about virtual reality you know, that's coming. And I really wanted to put on those goggles, you know, and those gloves and, and get in there. And now I could, I could go buy an Oculus Rift headset and, you know, go lose myself in some 3D virtual world right now. And I have zero interest in that. Like not, not even zero interest. The idea is repellent to me. I have no intention of that. Well, I, I don't have any other questions. I, it's been really great. I have lots of personal questions that I don't think are appropriate for in following your life that are appropriate for the Doomer podcast here. I don't, Ben, do you have any other things? You've you've had a little more outside relationship with KMO through Twitter than, than I have up to now. Ben's also that's... been a regular presence. Uh, when I was doing live streams on YouTube, Ben was a regular. He was yeah. you know, part of a small... Uh, you know, hardcore group of people that I could always count on to show up for those things. I would uh, copy paste in book notes into your YouTube chat, if you, even if it took four or five comments. <laughs> so I can't, um, I can't do those live streams anymore. Um, yeah, it was those, risky. Those, they, uh, the algorithms the, will hear the right thing. And, and it's not just me. It's not like I can just watch my own mouth, you know, and avoid the touchy subjects because right. the stuff that goes on in the chat can also get you banned oh wow yeah so anyway um, I, I have to be very careful with my youtube content now i think sorry i'm going to throw this phone for, in another room hold on a second. i had been rehydrating with this water here so my capacity there is uh pretty much maximized so it's been an hour <laughs> yeah I, they, they run an hour to an hour and a half, and it's been a great conversation. Anything, um, 
you want to ha go ahead and plug your podcasts one more time and we'll be sure to put links in the with the show notes so people can follow you if they're interested in your topics so padverb um i didn't name it <laughs> i don't know that the name actually means anything it's just we live in an age when almost every name is taken so padverb was available so it's like adverb but with a p at the beginning um i post everything I do, I post links to it in my Patreon feed and you don't have to support me on Patreon and there's lots of publicly available stuff there. So it's patreon.com slash KMO. That's probably the best place to keep track of what I do. Okay. And you are on Twitter, but not, not that much. I mostly retweet art on Twitter. I have made a, a commitment to not get into it with people, you know, not, not to go on Twitter and do ideological battle. It's just so unrewarding. Yep. Did so you, if you want to see cool, um, like alg algorithmically generated art or, you know, more traditionally generated art that I think was cool and I decided to retweet it, that's what you'll find in my Twitter feed. Okay. Okay, Mo, is it okay to plug the other one that starts with a C? Of course. The Sea Realm podcast, um, you know, I, I do the Sea Realm Vault podcast, which is for paid subscribers, and that's got to get my, you know... It's got to get my best energy because that's where the money comes from. Padverb podcast, I, I also get paid to do that. C Realm podcast, maybe I do one a month, uh, but I haven't done one in the last couple of months. It's just in terms of um, economic reality, it's got to be at the bottom of my to-do list. So it doesn't come out very often. Is is your the archives all there? Back to no. the early shows? No. Mm -hmm. No. How far back was it? How far back does C Realm go? I don't know. Um, if you go to the c -Realm website, you'll see that it doesn't look like a modern website. It's, I've been doing this for 16 years and, uh, it costs money to host those old files. And if there's a, you know, a 40 megabyte MP3 that I'm paying to host and like two people access it in a month, cause you know, it's a 12 year old file. That's just not worth it. Yeah. I, there's, it doesn't make financial sense for me to continue to pay money to make those old files available. And, you know, a lot of them are things that I kind of regret now. Like, you know, there is a time when I was one of the prophets of doom. I, you know, I would be guests on other people's podcasts, you know, preaching the the collapse message. And uh, I'm certainly not going to pay money to keep that material available. <laughs> you know? No, that totally makes sense. So, so, so people have to rely on your story here. They can't go digging through your digital archives to... oh they can i mean i'm it's not complete but yeah there's there's hundreds of hours worth of stuff that you can go and immerse yourself in if you're so inclined and then there's uh out of my head on youtube put that on while you, while you do the dishes folks well thought yeah out. youtube is so censorious um i i'm always getting you know automated messages from them saying such and such video violates our community standards. So we've deleted it. Here's the link to our community standards, you know, read it. So you understand why and it's a five-year-old video. Thing. You know, just recently I, I was, was banned for a week for a video that was two years old and it was a live stream. And I don't know what about it, you know, was problematic for them, but they said it violated their community standards. So they deleted it and locked me in the penalty box for a week or, you know, to contemplate my sins. So I, YouTube for me is attractive because I can take the smartphone, I can jabber into it for 20 minutes. I can then take another 40 minutes and edit a little bit and add some images and put it up and it's done. You know, whereas a podcast is a much more lengthy affair from beginning to end, you know, to get it out there. So the the bite sized nature of YouTube is attractive, but fighting with the algorithm, fighting with the sensors is so dispiriting. So I think I'm going to be doing a lot less of that. Great. Well, I might actually start do, doing more TikTok, even though TikTok seems like it's uh, like soulless and and shallow, but. TikTok videos can be up to 10 minutes. Most of them are 15, 20 seconds because, you know, they're appealing to that slow attention span. But I'm not looking for the TikTok algorithm to pr promote me. I'm just looking to use them as a video archive service that I don't have to pay for. I'll post links to my stuff on Patreon. And, you know, the people that follow me will look at, at those TikTok videos. I don't care if TikTok promotes me. So. Make sure you use your Huawei phone. Keep it in the CCP. 
<laughs> you know, I have a, a Google Pixel 6 now, but I still use the Huawei phone as my remote control for the TV. Sweet. <laughs> yeah. All right. Jabber, okay. jabber. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> You're trying much. to wrap it up, and I'm just going blah, blah, yeah, blah. Let's... Well, thank you, Camo. Thanks, Ben, for Thanks, bringing him on. And uh, we'll say goodbye to you all here. All right. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Night, night. Mm-hmm.